Welcome everyone to another edition of From the Woods Today. I'm Renee Williams and I'm here with my co-host Billy Thomas and we both work in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources and we have a very packed show for you today. Yeah, Renee, I'm really excited about today. You know, we're picking back up on our Forestry 101 series, which has been really popular. Um, we're also going to be talking about a um, forest health kind of virtual field day activities. And we have a special guest um, from the Kentucky Division of Forestry. We've got a snake ID or tree of the week. And really, we have also one really important announcement we kind of want to make. And we'd like to, if it's okay to bring up Mr. or Dr. Terry Connors. Um, it is. Dr. Connors has been our extension coordinator the last few years, but he's uh, really run our um, kind of wood industry interface in a lot of ways. And he's done, pr provided so much help to the wood industry. But Terry, one of the things I've really loved that what you brought here to Kentucky um, was kind of the wood magic and really the interacting with so many people. You've really turned a lot of people on um, to the power and the magic of wood. So Terry, thanks for everything. And I guess you're almost done with us here. At Tomorrow Kentucky. is his retirement date. Yes. <laughs> So we just want to thank you publicly for everything you've done for the department and all the help that you've given throughout the year. I really appreciate that. Now, just let me know who I have to send the check to for the kind <laughs> words. Hey, hey, don't worry, Terry. We'll be coming and bugging you after you retire for volunteer opportunities, okay? That's what happens when you're in America. You get to work for free. That's right. Exactly. Any wood sample. Hey, Terry, we need this ship to you. It, you know, <laughs> yeah, good point. There's been countless wood samples that Terry's ID for our county extension agents and um, clients all across the state. So I know, Terry, you've really contributed a lot. You know, another success you all really had a big one was last year. You helped out some of our um, wood manufacturing facilities on some stave production. I know they were having a lot of problems and, and they credited you and your team to um, really saving them millions of dollars. So, um, you know, another example of your contributions here in the state. You, you said the magic word, Billy, team is really important for those of us in extension. I couldn't have done anything without everybody else helping me out. Thanks again. Well, Terry, thank you again for what you've done for us here in Kentucky, and um, we wish you well in your retirement. And um, like I said, um, don't get too far away because we'll be reaching out to you for some volunteer opportunities. Gee, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> On with the show. <laughs> On with the show. <laughs> All right. All right, Terry. Well, thanks for being with us today again, and congratulations on an outstanding career. Um, thanks again. All right. All right, Renee, you know, since we kind of do have a lot going on, I'm thinking we probably ought to go ahead and get rolling with that. We Definitely. have uh, Dr. Jacob Muller is here with us um, again today. Um, Jacob, um, appreciate you doing this Forestry 101 series, a great way to kind of onboard uh, woodland owners and others uh, with an interest in um, getting engaged in their woodlands. Yeah, thanks, Billy. Uh, it's great to be here, and I, I love making these videos and, and getting to, to share them with you all, so it's, it's fun. Awesome. Yeah, and I think today we're going to be talking about inventory in your woodland um, and, that, and that part of it. We are, yeah. And so this is just kind of another piece, but an important piece uh, if you're thinking about creating a management plan or any sort of uh, stewardship plan for, for your own woodland or forest, uh, having accurate uh, inventory is, is so important that can help you make uh, better management decisions on your, on your woodland or in your forest. All right, Renee, without any further ado, I'll go ahead and um, pull that up. Let me go ahead and stop my video. Hi, uh, welcome back to Forestry 101. Uh, today we're going to be talking about forest inventory and why forest inventory uh, is important for us uh, as foresters uh, as well as uh, forest and woodland owners. And so forest inventory is really a systematic uh, collection of the data within our forest uh, as well as the information that's contained within that forest uh, so that we can assess it uh, and analyze it for, for our different management objectives. In forestry, we often call a timber inventory a timber cruise. Uh, and cruises can be used to visually assess uh, the timber and determine potential risks, uh, whether that's uh, insect and disease vulnerabilities, uh, wildfire risk, or any other uh, risk to perturbation. Uh, we can assess that during uh, timber cruise. Uh, additionally, we can uh, combine our timber cruises with uh, wildlife surveys uh, and uh, determine the number and type of wildlife uh, found within that, within that forest. 
So a timber cruise is really a sample uh, of the stand. And often we use uh, plots to help us uh, with these samples. So generally when we're doing a uh, timber cruise, uh, this is gonna include uh, measurements that will help us estimate uh, merchantable volume. And so we'll take the DBH, so the diameter at breast height. Uh, we'll take the merchantable height, uh, generally a number of logs, either eight foot or 16 foot logs. Uh, and then we'll calculate, uh, rather subtract uh, the defects that are found within uh, that particular tree. Uh, some trees have uh, frost scars or fire scars, uh, or they have kind of little knots where there used to be branches as the tree grows. And so these are little things that affect uh, the quality of the tree and the grade of the tree. Uh, and thus uh, impacting how valuable or, or how much that, that particular tree uh, is worth. And so when we're taking sample plots, we have uh, a fixed area plot or a fixed radius plot. Uh, and generally that means that it's a fixed circle. And so we have uh, an area that we're sampling. Generally, uh, we're either sampling a 10th acre plot or a fifth acre plot. Uh, and so we can calculate the area of that plot uh, and then uh, calculate the radius that it would take to sample that, that particular area. And so a fifth acre plot uh, is a pretty large plot uh, and that would have a radius of about 52.7 feet. And so you'd have a plot center and you'd stick uh, a stake or a flag or, or a stick at plot center and then you'd walk out uh, a tape measure 52.7 uh, feet uh, and then you'd swing all the way around that circle 360 degrees uh, and you'd measure every tree found within that circle. So every tree was within, within uh, your plot. So plot size is, is important when we're trying to calculate a per acre basis uh, or, or, a, or a per unit area basis, right? So the area of the, the forest tract, if we want to calculate uh, or estimate all of the standing volume uh, in our particular woodland, uh, we need to be able to um, expand uh, or extrapolate that data from the plot level uh, to a per acre and beyond uh, estimate. And so if we have a fifth acre plot, uh, we'd simply multiply by five, right? So we have a fifth acre, so five is our denominator. Uh, five is going to be our expansion factor uh, for multiplying to a per acre basis. And so we take the amount of volume uh, in that particular uh, half, or excuse me, that fifth acre, and we multiply that by five, and we can say this is an estimate of the volume, or this is an estimate of the number of trees, or this is an estimate of the density uh, at a per acre basis. And then we can again expand that to a larger area. Say we're working in, in 30 acres or so. We can again multiply that number by 30 uh, to get an estimate of, of the area of our uh, our total uh, tract of forest or our woodland. <clears throat> and so if we had a 10th acre plot, uh, our expansion factor would be 10, right? So we'd multiply that by 10 because a 10th acre plot is smaller than a fifth acre. So we need to multiply it uh, by 10 this time to get a per acre basis. So finally, that leads us to the question, how many plots should I take? Uh, and that's not really an easy uh, question to answer. Um, because it really depends on uh, how variable your woodland or forest is. Uh, if you have a lot of heterogeneity, that being a lot of different species and pockets of species and different sizes and different structures, uh, both vertically and spread out horizontally across your woodland and forest, uh, then you'll need to increase the number of plots uh, to, to be uh, statistically uh, accurate or significant in your uh, estimates of what's actually contained in the forest. Uh, if you have a really homogeneous stand, that being similar species, similar sizes, similar uh, densities across the, the forest or woodland, then you can uh, really get away with taking fewer plots to still give an accurate, uh, robust estimate of what's contained within that forest. Uh, and so a general rule of thumb is to measure around 10% uh, of your forest. And so if you have a uh, 50 acre woodland, uh, then 10% of that would be about five acres. Uh, and if you're taking fifth acre plots, remember 
uh, we'd have to take five plots uh, to calculate uh, or to add up to one acre. So we would have to take five times five. Uh, we'd have to take 25 plots, uh, 25 fifth acre plots to get us five acres or 10% uh, of a 50 acre uh, woodland. So we need to determine the size of our trees. And so we take a measurement called uh, DBH, or diameter at breast height. And so that's about 4.5 feet uh, from the ground uh, up on the tree. And so we take uh, a diameter uh, of that using uh, a logger tape. And so here I've got a logger tape. And so I pull the two ends together and I can see I've got about 21 or 20.1 uh, inches in diameter for this tree. <clears throat> Additionally, we can use what's called a Biltmore stick uh, to help us uh, estimate uh, the size or the, the diameter of the tree or the DBH of the tree. And so we've got uh, a calibrated cruiser stick here uh, that will give us an estimate of, of the diameter uh, at breast height. And so we put this uh, stick, the Biltmore stick, up against the tree. Uh, we hold uh, the stick out uh, about uh, or exactly 25 inches. So these are calibrated to be 25 inches from our eye. And so uh, we hold this 25 inches uh, and then we look, we line up this edge to the side of the tree, the edge of the bark. <clears throat> then we look through uh, on this side and we can see uh, again, I'm getting right at about uh, 20, uh, to 21 inches uh, for our DBH. And so this isn't as accurate of an estimate, but it helps us give really quick estimates uh, moving through our forest and doing our, uh, our plots. When we're measuring the height of a tree, again, we can use a couple different instruments. <clears throat> well, we can use uh, this Merit hypsometer, uh, which is calibrated again on this uh, Biltmore stick uh, to help us get an estimation uh, or estimate of logs. And so you can see here on this scale, uh, it's got from zero to one, one to two. And so these are the number of 16 foot logs when we're standing 66 feet away from the tree and we hold the stick up uh, perpendicular to the ground and then we look up the tree we place this end on the at the base of the tree or we could put it about a foot off the ground uh, which is typically the stump height or where the tree will be cut uh, when it is uh, harvested and hold that up and we can calculate the number of logs by looking at this we can also use uh, this laser hypsometer uh, to help us measure tree heights or merchantable height uh, of the tree. And so if we use this hypsometer, we're looking through, we're taking a couple different uh, angles to where we see the merchantable height uh, and then to the base of the tree. Uh, and then it uses some lasers where it shoots the horizontal distance to that tree then it calculates the angle looking up and then the angle looking down. And so we're using some uh, trigonometry equations to calculate uh, the height of the tree. It's all contained within this little device here. Uh, and then we can uh, calculate the number of logs within that particular uh, length uh, of, of tree up to the merchantable height. Ultimately, if you're a landowner or a woodland owner, uh, you can work with a forester to come up with a plan to inventory your forest uh, to have a statistically significant, robust uh, inventory of your forest so that you have a good idea of what's out there, the value of your forest, uh, what's contained in the forest, uh, which will really help uh, ultimately with uh, you uh, meeting your management objectives for that particular uh, forest.
thanks for joining me today. I hope you learned a little bit more about forest inventory uh, and why it's so important that we sample our forest through taking plots uh, that will help us get a better idea of what's contained uh, out here in these forests and woodlands. Uh, the more we know about the forest, the more we know, the more information we have and data we have, uh, the better we can manage uh, and meet uh, our management objectives uh, and reach our management goals. Uh, and so uh, please reach out with any questions to UK Forestry Extension. Uh, and until next time, I hope you're well and we'll see you later. Thanks, bye. That was a great video, Jacob. We really appreciate you uh, doing that. And um, one thing I, 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 you know, you're taking me back to high school and making me have to think these trig, trig equations here. But uh, if someone is wanting to do this, I know you mentioned this a little bit and touched on it, but are they better off getting a forester or someone from KDF to help them? Or should they actually try to perform this on their own? Uh, I think it really depends on, on what you're your objectives or, or management goals are for that. If you're just kind of interested in, in what's out there, um, then you can certainly go out and you can even create a lot of these tools. I didn't go into it in the video, but you can create little homemade tools uh, calibrated to your eye or your arm length to, to sample your forest and kind of get a good idea of, of what's out there. But if you're entering into some sort of uh, stewardship contract, uh, then it's really important to have a pretty accurate uh, inventory, and I think it might even be required in that uh, stewardship agreement. So uh, it really depends on what you're interested in and, um, and kind of the level or intensity that you want to sample uh, yeah. your inventory. Jacob, I, I appreciate the video because, uh, you know, I think you've removed maybe some of the mystery that people might think about. All right, you just see a bunch of trees out there. How do we get a handle on what we've got? And really, there's a really um, a, a, a procedure to do that. And um, it's not rocket science. It's a little bit harder than that. No, um, but it is. You, know, you just have to follow that procedure. And again, I, I, I think the important thing for people to recognize is that when we make recommendations as foresters on practices that need to be done, a uh, part of that is obviously based on the landowner's objectives, but it also an important part is what is that resource that's out there right now and th those inventories give us that information that allow us to make informed decisions so that we can move that property in the direction the landowners are interested in so a really important topic Jacob for sure yep yep exactly and that's it's yeah I'm glad you hit on that because kind of the first thing we do in a management plan is talk about our objectives and then we go in inventory and collect uh, data and then determine if our, our management objectives are feasible uh, and then kind of tweak those and, and move forward with different management uh, tactics and applications. So, yeah. so I know you're doing this as a series too. So we look forward to the, to the next, uh, next edition of the series. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's uh, getting into a little bit more about silviculture, the practice and application. So, and that's really tying a lot of these things together. And um, I think, uh, that's kind of where a lot of my my uh, heart lies in, in civil culture. So I'm excited for, for the next video. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah, this whole series is really building up some great content for us and for others down the road, you know, to use and access. So, Jacob, appreciate your efforts in this. I know those videos um, can take some time to put together. Um, so I appreciate that, that commitment that you've given. Yeah. Yep. And remember, folks, if you haven't, if you've missed some of the series um, that Jacob has done, you can always go to fromthewoodstoday.com and uh, see all of those shows. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. And, you know, also on our YouTube page, um, Renee, you all have been doing a really good job of parsing out um, these different segments and stuff. So if you got, want to see the whole series, you can check out that whole series by visiting our YouTube page. Um, right. YouTube page, so. and there's um, a Forestry 101 section, so you can just click on it and see them all right in one spot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, good stuff. So again, you know, another great segment there, Renee. Um, yeah. you know, and I guess to keep this ball rolling, we've got a snake identification one. You know, this is yeah. a popular segment. Segment. And um, I know we get a lot of feedback and interest from folks on this. So um, I don't know if I'm Dr. Springer's available to hey. introduce your, your segment for today. Matt, how are you? I'm fine. How about everybody? 
What what kind of snake are we talking about today? Are you going to give it as a surprise? <laughs> well, it'll come out as a surprise. And I think most folks won't even be familiar with this species. It's a relatively uncommon one. Uh, I actually just got this uh, image in uh, about a week ago, well, a week and a half ago. Uh, and it's the second time I've encountered this species in the four years I've been here. Awesome. So in terms of the number of images I get for snakes, this is really low on the list. Uh -huh. So, um, but it's a really gorgeous species and, uh, well, we'll see. All right. All right. Good morning. This is Dr. Matt Springer from the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources here at the University of Kentucky. And I am here today for our Snake ID of the Week challenge. As always, I want to highlight our Snake ID website, uh, found at kysnakes.ca.uky.edu. Uh, it's a great resource if you ever have a snake that you're not sure what it is. Um, we have several functions and lots of pictures to help you ID it. Now let's get into our challenge picture of the week. This is submitted last week and then um, the reason I chose it is actually because it's, it's not one that uh, I have submitted very often at all. This is honestly the second time I've seen it um, in four years. Uh, so it's a, it's a relatively uncommon snake that folks come across. Uh, not that it's uncommon in the state, uh, it's certainly less abundant than things like water snake species uh, or our, our rat snakes, but it's one that's not, you know, threatened or endangered. Now, let's start off with trying to ID this species. First and foremost, we look at the pattern uh, on the snake and we don't see any kind of uh, pattern present on the actual body of the animal. Uh, for the most part, we have a uh, head color uh, that is a little darker than the tan body. Uh, but let's try to, you know, figure out if this is a venomous or a non-venomous species and focus on the head. Um, and we see that this is a, a relatively slender head. The snake itself is relatively slender. Uh, by the size of um, the grass that it's in, you know, we don't have a lot of scale here, but it looks to be a smaller snake. Um, we don't have a great look at the eyes, so we can't see that pupil shape. Um, we, but we really don't see any kind of triangular head. It's really a slender head, slender body. So this would point more towards a non-venomous species. Lack of pattern uh, on the body and the, the head color uh, being darker than the tan body. If we put that in and start looking at the pictures present within our website, we have a couple options that pop up, two of which here uh, are fairly similar. Um, the top one is actually a really slender snake um, that is, you know, not um, overly uh, small as, as the species that we're trying to ID. Uh, it's a couple feet in length, but it's a very s slender body. Uh, the other sn snake on the bottom here um, is a much larger snake. Uh, it gets upwards of five feet in length. So um, the the big thing here is we have two other options that are potential that meet our, our color um, similarity with the species that we're trying to ID. Uh, however, um, don't quite fit. And that, the top picture there is an Easter coach whip, a really rare snake. And the bottom one there is actually a pine snake, which is that larger species, uh, which may or may not actually be present in the state. It's only been found in um, a cert one certain locality. Um, and we're not sure if it actually was present there because of being released as a, a pet uh, snake. But the last option that's present, if you look at the, the website, uh, is this, and this is our correct answer. It's the red-bellied snake. Um, and unfortunately, with the picture that we had there, it didn't really show off the actual feature that it's most known for, which is a strikingly bright red belly. Um, we had a very brown top side, and, and this snake um, actually has a slightly different color variation that's uh, observed, which is a much grayer um, coloration into its body, but the head is almost always darker than the body, as you see, uh, even in the gray uh, phase, uh, and that belly just sticks through. Another feature that's a good identifying factor is actually the, the partial ring around the neck behind the head uh, is white. It's incomplete, but it's a series of white blotches that kind of gives a ring-esque look. 
Uh, and then below both eyes uh, is a white dot that is actually a, a distinguishing feature for the species. Now these guys are only about eight to 10 to 12 inches in length. So they're really small. Um, they are an actor similar to the hawknose snake. They'll play dead, they'll put on a show, they'll flatten themselves out all on defense, but rarely actually do bite. And even if they do, they are a non venomous species. I'm gonna finish up here on uh, our snakes in general, like I always do. Make sure you are positively identifying a snake that uh, is in front of you uh, so that you know whether or not you need to avoid it. You know, at, very easily in Kentucky, you can get to venomous or non-venomous by using the head shape, pupils, and patterns. If you wanna reduce the possibility of running into snakes, um, reduce shrubby areas around your house or garden, keep your grass mowed short, Keep those wood piles, rock piles away from your house and off into a place that uh, you don't run into very often. Remember, there's lots of positive benefits to having snakes around your landscape. Keeps those rodent populations in check, helps, helps to reduce tick uh, and Lyme disease loads in the landscape and ecosystems. If you have any questions, we have the wonderful UK snake website as a resource found once again at kysnakes.ca.uky.edu. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Well, thank you, Matt, for that presentation. We greatly appreciate it. And um, sounds like that snake wasn't something that you normally see around here. Why is that? Uh, they're just relatively uh, uncommon. Uh, Behavior-wise, they're, you know, they're found in forests and field edges. They actually uh, move about quite a bit, um, migrating to their hibernaculums or from their hibernaculums about this time of year. Uh, it's just they're, they're one of those species that just exists at a lower density and, and population number. It doesn't look like we have any questions about it. Um, can you answer me this? As I know it's probably something on wildlife sounds we should do, but um, what do snakes eat? Well, that depends on the snake. Uh, so um, our rat snakes eat a lot of uh, rodents and um, sometimes bird eggs, um, whereas the species for today actually consumes a lot of slugs and insects and earthworms. Oh. So it, it can range uh, from our timber rattlesnakes, which is our, one of our larger species, eats squirrels and rabbits, down to just eating, um, you know, fish or like today, slugs and uh, small invertebrates. Sounds like so a wide it, range of things. <laughs> it's, a, it's a wide range of things, and, and all of those are good benefits to have and reasons to have them around. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, good. thank you so much for your presentation. We greatly appreciate it. Yeah. You guys have a wonderful day. Yeah, you thanks. Too. I appreciate it very much. All right. Those are always fun, Renee. I, I, think I know. I really enjoyed those. And um, it's kind of cool. That's one that, you know, he hasn't seen that much. So mm -hmm. yeah, Definitely. Fun. So I guess we're moving on to our tree of the week this week. Yeah. And we're kind of, um, Laurie couldn't be with us um, on camera today, um, but she did put together this video for us on the tree of the week. And she's kind of taken a, um, gotten away from our hardwoods for this week. And we're going to do one of our softwood species. And now here in Kentucky, we don't have very many pine trees or softwood trees. Um, but the one that she's talking about really is a pretty important one and there's a lot of interest in trying to um, restore this tree in some places where it used to be more prominent so um, I'm not going to tell you what it is yet I'll let you all see that in the video but I'm Laurie Thomas with the University of Kentucky Forestry and Natural Resource Extension and I'm here with the tree of the week the shortleaf pine shortleaf pine Pinus echinata is one of the commercially important southern yellow pines and depending upon locale, the species is also called shortleaf yellow pine, southern yellow pine, old field pine, short straw pine, or Arkansas soft pine. It is a medium to large pine that grows 80 to 100 feet tall and up to 2 to 3 feet in diameter. The tree typically has a clear straight trunk with small somewhat pyramid shaped crown. Shortleaf pine is relatively slow growing and shade intolerant. And it reaches maturity at 170 years, at 170 years of age, but may live much longer. Shortleaf pine has the widest geographic range of any pine in the southeastern United States. It's found in 22 states, and Arkansas has more shortleaf pine than any other state. Shortleaf pine has great adaptability for soils, moisture, and temperature. This is the hardiest and most adaptable of the southern pines. However, it grows best on moist, well-drained, deep, sandy, or silty soils. It commonly grows in even age stands, but in Kentucky it grows in a mix of oak pine stands on dry uplands. It is the pioneer species that commonly invades old fields that have been abandoned from agriculture. 
Shortleaf pine is generally fire resistant, but wildfires in young plantations in the south um, can be damaging. The crowns are usually killed, but young shortleaf pine has the remarkable ability to re-sprout after the main stem is destroyed by fire or cutting. And fire is an important a management tool for shortleaf pine. Fire effectively prepares the necessary seabed for regeneration and can be used con to control competing hardwoods. The Shortleaf Pine Initiative was launched in the spring of 2013 in response to the dramatic decline of this pine. Over the last 30 years, there has been a more than 50% decline in shortleaf pine ecosystems, with the most significant declines east of the Mississippi River. Extensive logging, subsistence farming, the loss of open-range grazing of livestock, and the lack of appropriate disturbances such as fire for subsequent regeneration have contributed to a decline in its range since 1980. The Shortleaf Pine Initiative was formed to develop a wide-range conservation, conservation plan for shortleaf pine to identify optimum restoration strategies, increase coordination among shortleaf proponents, and maximize the effectiveness of ongoing efforts. The Shortleaf Pine Initiative represents a broad range of public and private organizations as well as key state and federal agencies working in the shortleaf pine ecosystems. Shortleaf pine is an evergreen conifer with needle-like leaves. The needles are in bundles or fascicles of twos and threes, as you can see in the photo. The needles are typically three to five inches long, they're slender and they're flexible and they're typically dark yellow, green, more of a green in color, and the needles will typically persist two to four years. Shortleaf pine is monoecious, which means a tree has both male and female flowers. The flowers of shortleaf pine are cone-like structures, and the male flower is yellow-green to reddish-purple before ripening to a brown when the pollen is shed. The female flower is green to red to purple, and the female flowers emerge shortly after the male flowers. The flowers are wind pollinated in the spring. The fruit of shortleaf pine is a cone, a pine cone. The cones are egg-shaped and about two inches long and they're nearly sessile and they're green when they're immature. They tend to be a red to brown in color and have a small prickle or spike as they ripen. The pine cones mature in the fall of the second growing season. And once the cone ripens and dries out in late October to early November, the bracts open and the winged seeds fall out, usually landing relatively close to the parent tree. And about 90% of the seeds fall within the first two months of opening. The seeds overwinter on the ground and those remaining germinate the following spring. However, many of the seeds are eaten by small mammals and birds. Shortleaf pine begins seed production around 20 years of age with a good seed crop every three to 10 years and the cones will persist on the tree long after they are empty. Shortleaf pine seeds are an important food source for birds and small mammals over the lean winter months, and deer browse the seedlings and saplings, which also provide cover for wild turkey and bobwhite quail. The older, mature to overmature shortleaf pines with red heart rot provide habitat for cavity nesting birds. In fact, they are the primary nesting trees for the federally endangered red cockaded woodpecker. The decline of older mature shortleaf pines has resulted in a decline in the population of red cockaded woodpecker. Shortleaf pine is also the larval host of the elfin butterfly. The bark on shortleaf pine is dark and rough and scaly on young trees, but as the tree ages the bark becomes more of a reddish brown and it's broken into flat scaly plates. And the plates have small surface pockets that are about the size of a pencil point, which are resin or pitch pockets. And this is a good characteristic to use in tree identification when you can't get to the needles. It's easy to tell shortleaf pine from pitch pine because shortleaf pine has pitch pockets and pitch pine does not have pitch pockets. Go figure. The wood of shortleaf pine is straight grained with fine to medium with a fine to medium texture. It's hard, dense, and has excellent strength to weight ratio. The heartwood is a reddish brown and the sapwood is yellowish white. The heartwood is rated as moderate to low in decay resistance. Overall, it works fairly well with most tools, though the resin can gum up tools and clog sandpaper. Shortleaf pine glues and finishes well. Shortleaf pine is used in heavy construction, such as bridges, beams, poles, railroad ties, etc. It's also used for making plywood and veneer and flooring and pulpwood. Even the tap, tap roots are used for pulpwood, and the oleoresins from the tree are extracted to make turpentine. 
The national champion shortleaf pine is in Smith, Texas. It's 154 inches in circumference, 91 feet tall, with a 66 foot crown spread. The Kentucky champion is in McCreary County in the Daniel Boone National Forest. It's 93 inches in circumference, 139 feet tall, with a 36 foot crown spread. If you'd like to know more about champion trees, check out American Forest National Register of Champion Trees or check out the Kentucky Division of Forestry Champion Trees. Now for a few fun facts about shortleaf pine. A unique feature of shortleaf is the ability of young trees to sprout following fire. This sprouting ability is due to the development of a pronounced J-shaped crook at or below the ground surface. In the crook, numerous dormant buds develop which allow sprouting if the top is killed. During the Revolutionary War in the early 1800s, shortleaf pine was a major timber source in the eastern part of its range for a variety of products, including shipbuilding and homes. In the western portion of its range, shortleaf pine dominated the forest industry during the mid to late 1800s and early 1900s until the Great Depression. It was so highly valued that loblolly pine timber was marketed as shortleaf. The scientific genus name Pinus is Latin for pine, and the species name Echinata is from the Greek, Greek echinos, which means hedgehog or prickly, in reference to the cone scales. Thanks for joining me today to learn about this pine. I hope you get the opportunity to get out into your woodland, local park, or neighborhood and enjoy the superb shortleaf pine. Billy, one thing I noticed, she mentioned pulpwood, and some people out there may not know what pulpwood is. Do you mind explaining that a little bit? Sure, pulpwood um, goes into making pulp um, for paper and other uses. And typically it means um, it will be smaller materials, um, you know, typically four inches and smaller in size. So a lot of our branches and other things can end up as pulpwood where we have pulp markets. Unfortunately, we don't have a, a large number of pulp markets in Kentucky, which is also kind of a hindrance to doing forest management um, because we may not have markets for some of that product that's out there, which makes doing some other things maybe a little more costly than it would otherwise exist. So it's basically the material that goes into um, paper, if you will. And a lot of it is really based on softwoods and it has to do really with their, their fiber structure. Um, you know, um, Dr. Connors could probably talk to us for a week about um, <laughs> fiber structures, but um, it does come down to just kind of different, um, the, the, the way they're made up. So it just works better for paper. Okay, sounds good. All right, well, I guess moving on, we have our uh, Forest Health Field Day coming up, and we have uh, several people on, um, uh, Dr. Crocker and Megan Buland and Alexandria Blevins, um, on to talk about that, and uh, so whoever wants to talk about it a little bit first, <laughs> you can go ahead. I, I would say before we start, it seems like we're having to do a lot of virtual things anymore, but um, I know. Uh, yeah, but I'm really excited to hear about this, and um, I appreciate you all putting this together, and um, yeah, let's let the folks know. Great. So yes, as you mentioned, we're having to do a lot of virtual things these days. So initially we were planning to do um, a series of in-person forest health field dates across the state. Um, and obviously our plans changed uh, with COVID and the changing situation. So we've shifted those into a series of virtual forest health field dates in partnership with Kentucky Division of Forestry and the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves, highlighting different issues and what you can do to improve the health of your woods, but kind of in partnership with some of those natural areas where you can go and see some of this on your own, if not with us. Um, so today we're going to take a quick visit to Tom Dorman State Nature Preserve to learn a little bit about what they're dealing with, um, with emerald ash borer, some uh, invasive plants, and also learn about the research and the work that's ongoing to find uh, resistant lingering ash and maybe what you can be doing to help bring back ash in the future. So I'm going to show you a video um, and then after that I'm going to point you to uh, Megan Buland and Alexander Blevin, who are here with us today, and also introduce you to our interactive story map, which is a website that you can go to and walk through this. Um, and it's got videos and fun information, and I think is a great resource for you, as well as an educational resource you can share with others, and um, kind of just learning more about a new place. And we're hoping to add to that in the future. So first, I'm going to share this video, and then we'll, we'll bring it back, and you can ch chat with Megan and Alexandra about the work that they've been doing and um, this project. Wonderful. Welcome to Tom Dorman State Nature Preserve. 
located on the banks of the Kentucky River Palisades in Jessamine and Girard counties. This summer, University of Kentucky's Forest Health Extension, the Kentucky Division of Forestry, and the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves met at Tom Dorman to document the presence of lingering ash. Emerald ash borer, or EAB, is an invasive insect that has been infesting and killing ash trees in the eastern U.S. since its introduction in 2002. Infested trees are characterized by yellowing foliage, die back in the tree canopy, and eventually tree death as beetle larvae feed and mature under the bark. While the majority of ash trees will ultimately die after EAB infestation, there are individual ash trees which may have some resistance to the borer. These trees are known as lingering ash. Lingering ash may hold the key to potentially developing ash trees that are resistant to the emerald ash borer in the future. The Kentucky Division of Forestry's Forest Health Group and the University of Kentucky Forest Health Extension Lab are working to document the presence of lingering ash trees in Kentucky, and we need your help. In areas where 95% or more of ash have died from EAB, ash trees that are still living are potential candidates for lingering ash. If you would like to help in the search for lingering ash in Kentucky, download the Tree Snap app to record lingering ash trees in our forests and woodlands. To learn more, check out our new interactive story map and join us as we explore Tom Dorman State Nature Preserve, EAB, and lingering ash in Kentucky. Wonderful. Well, for that thank video. you for uh, that video and also for creating this fantastic uh, resource. So while I pull up that website, um, I'd like to turn it over to Megan Buland, who's uh, in the Forest Health Extension Lab here at UK and has been doing a lot of work on this project. Thanks, Dr. Crocker. So my name is Megan. I work with Dr. Crocker in Forest Health Extension here at UK. And this project was, uh, was created because originally we were hoping to do this as in-person uh, work this summer. We wanted to you know, visit with you all and look at some natural areas and document the presence of lingering ash, talk about emerald ash borer and the impacts of invasive species on our Kentucky woodlands. But unfortunately, ultimately that wasn't able to happen with um, a lot of the things that have been going on this year. So we decided to go with a virtual field day instead. And the story map that we developed in collaboration with the Kentucky Division of Forestry and with the help of Nature Preserves at Tom Dorman is designed to kind of take you on a walk through Tom Dorman State Nature Preserve uh, to provide you with some background information on the importance of ash in our forests and woodlands here in Kentucky and the impact the emerald ash borer has had on ash trees and on the ecology of our natural areas. But you know, not, not everything, not all hope is lost for ash trees, and that's what we kind of like to highlight here with this story map, is that there is some hope for the future for ash trees with the idea of lingering ash. And lingering ash are these trees that exist in areas where the majority of ash have been killed by EAB, but there are a few trees that remain, and it's thought that possibly the genetics of those trees might be, uh, be potential candidates for creating ash that are resistant to EAB sometime in the future. So we created this interactive story map at Tom Dorman to kind of highlight the beauty of one of our natural areas here in central Kentucky and provide you with an educational resource that you can share uh, with landowners and with student groups to help them learn a little bit more about the ecology of these areas, emerald ash borer and lingering ash here in central Kentucky. And we wouldn't have been able to do any of this without the help of nature preserves, but also of the Kentucky Division of Forestry. And Alexandra Blevins works with KDF, and she is able to join us here today to talk a little bit about KDF and lingering ash. Hello, everyone, and thanks for having me. And um, I urge everyone, if you haven't seen that amazing story map that was built by Megan, um, please take a look at it in detail. It's um, quite the feat that she was able to get that done. It's um, something that I'll be looking at for probably the next week or so. <laughs> um, and so, yes, I'm Alexandra Blevins, and I am the Forest Health Specialist with the Kentucky Division of Forestry. 
And so as both Ellen and Megan have stated, we have been working together on this Lingering Ash project for a while now. Um, and so what KDS specific role in that would be um, on a day to day basis, I am out in our woodlands uh, looking for these lingering or surviving ash trees. And so, um, as you may know, we have the white, the green and the blue ash that are prevalent here within the state. And, um, you know, they've all been hit differently by this invasive beetle, the emerald ash borer. And so we um, do these drive-by surveys um, and also aerial surveys and uh, document new locations of ash decline and then go even further and track down those trees and look for new detections of this beetle. And then when we have um, areas where 95% of the ash has, uh, you know, died due to this beetle, we can uh, look for those surviving trees and uh, document their location and then check on them um, from year to year in the future. And what we are specifically looking for are, um, you know, whether they have seed and we can then uh, collect seed from those lingering surviving trees. And we have um, some nurseries in various parts of the state and we'll take that seed and then plant it and hope um, to create a seed orchard for the future that has these resistant trees. And, uh, you know, the end goal is to actually, you know, once those trees grow and prevail, then we can get them back out into the wild. And so this is uh, just really one of the programs that KDF is involved with, with our forest health program. Uh, we have uh, several other, uh, you know, Jacob had mentioned when you're cruising your timber, there are these insects and diseases that you should be aware of. Um, we have a myriad of threats here within our state that are, are affecting our forest health. And so um, the forest health program is, you know, our goal is to safeguard these woodlands as much as possible from these various threats, whether it's, uh, you know, the emerald ash borer or uh, the hemlock woolly adelgid, these invasive insects or it could be diseases such as our newest invader, uh, laurel wilt disease, which is affecting sassafras and potentially spicebush within our state. And then um, there's also the constant battle of invasive plants um, that we're battling. So, uh, you know, on a day to day, I'm out doing one of these various projects. So it keeps me on my toes. Wonderful. So I really recommend you check out this great resource that um, we put together. And I want to, uh, you know, just recognize the work that Megan has done on this and put, making a really fun, interactive, I mean, we can't be out in the woods with you, but, you know, the next best thing. Uh, and encourage you to get out, go visit Tom Dorman and check out some of the things that we talked about. Uh, we are interested in expanding this to other natural areas across the state. Um, so let us know uh, how we could work with you to make this a better resource and um, if there's an area we should we should visit next. So if anybody has any questions about this, please put them in the chat pod and we will get them answered. But um, one thing I was wondering is, um, do you have any idea on why some of the ash or the EAB didn't touch? I mean, is there something specific you're seeing in those trees? Yes, um, I would, oh, go ahead, Ellen. <laughs> no, no, you go first, Alexandra. <laughs> Ellen's the almighty mastermind. Uh, <laughs> I, I look to her as an inspiration. Um, I'll try my best. Um, the feeling is mutual. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm the greenhorn. <laughs> but, um, you know, these trees, um, you know, it's kind of, you can think of them, uh, you know, as our immune system in a human. Some of them are just built better um, I guess is the way I would put it. Um, and we're just out there looking, you know, it's kind of like searching for a needle in a haystack uh, scenario. Um, just looking for those really strong ash trees that are able to, you know, whether it's to callus over the EAB gallery and cull that beetle right at the start, or, um, you know, just able to prevail um, over time. Mm -hmm. I'll let and the 
Yeah. A lot of the trees that we see that are still out there are probably just lucky, to be honest. Um, you know, they're just lucky they haven't been killed yet. Not that there's anything genetically superior about them that's, you know, making them unattractive to those beetles, or maybe um, what they found with some of these lingering ash. And there's been a great work done by the Forest Service's Northern Research Station on you know, what's the, the uh, mechanism for this? Sometimes those resistant trees, those lingering trees will actually prevent the larvae from, from growing and surviving in the tree, which is exciting because mm -hmm. that's the kind of inheritable genetic resistance that we want to see passed on. Unfortunately, a lot of what we see in our woods um, are uh, regeneration of ash. There's nothing special about that ash. It's perfectly susceptible to the emerald ash borer. It's just that the seeds in that seed bank that have come up since those mature trees have died. So what we're really interested in are, again, those lingering trees where 95 plus percent of the trees in an area have been dead for at least two years. Um, and those, they're still a healthy tree. Um, so looking for those trees. And if you have potential candidates, um, upload them uh, as observations in the TreeSnap app. So it's treesnap.org. The app is free for Android or iPhone. And um, over the next uh, year, our plan is to go through those, follow up with those observations, and try to get material from those trees that then we can, as uh, Alexandra mentioned, uh, Kentucky Division of Forestry is spearheading that, and we'll take the lead on that. So I'm excited about the future for ash. I think um, it's really great to see that there is some resistance out there and uh, I'm, I'm excited to be part of that search for it. it Ellen, I had a quick question. Um, I know it's kind of still preliminary looking at these lingering ash. Um, are there any kind of trends that we're seeing as far as maybe their position in the landscape or other trees that they're around or, well, I or would even say, species of ash? Yeah, so blue ash is more resistant than green or white ash, uh, just naturally. Um, so you will see blue ash hanging on for longer, not necessarily that it won't die eventually, um, but that it is going to be more resistant than either the, the green or the white ash, which are our three major species. Um, the other thing I would say is that in states where emerald ash borer has been there for longer, uh, we're talking a handful of trees. So as Alexander mentioned, we're looking for the needle in the haystack. And unfortunately, it's probably not going to be a large number of trees. And even of those that we find, probably a good number of them are just going to be lucky. Uh, not that they're not valuable and not that they're not great, but they wouldn't necessarily have that genetic resistance we're looking for. Um, so I think that's why we need to loop in as many partners as possible. And if you've got trees you'd like to nominate for this, just get the TreeSnap app, uh, download it to your phone and upload those observations to us. Yeah, I, I would say real quick, um, Alexandra, great having you on. Thank you so much for your work. Um, you know, the relationship between Extension and Kentucky Division of Forestry is a strong one, and um, you all are demonstrating that today. And Megan, I wanted to brag on your storyboard. Um, I had a chance to preview that earlier, um, and it's really impressive. And then Dr. Crocker, what you're doing with the, the Forest Health Extension Lab here at the university is really awesome, and um, I really appreciate your leadership and guidance of this group, and um, it's really great what you all are doing. Thank you. Well, thank you, Billy. And as you mentioned, it's a whole team of people who are trying to make our forests as healthy as they can be and improve the quality of our trees and woodlands. And we love being on this program. So thank you for the opportunity to talk about this. Excellent. Excellent. Wow, Renee, awesome, man. I what know. Awesome show, really. I mean, really some heavy hitters with some great content. Um, wow, yeah. We told them we had a packed show today, and we <laughs> definitely did. Um, so, you know, as always, if you can't think of something that you were thinking of and you need to uh, give us a shout out, you can um, email us at forestry.extension at uky.edu. Um, also go to fromthewoodstoday.com and it has all of our past shows there. There's also even a, a link to take a survey or if you find a snake like Matt and showed um, or uh, even like Lori, she did, a, you know, somebody asked about shore leaf pine and that's the reason why we did that. So if you have, you know, suggestions for the show, you can type them in there and send them our way and um, you never know when we'll use them so no, no, um, no. yeah I was gonna say Renee also for our Facebook live folks out there please leave comments on that and we follow up on those comments and we'll get back to you but um, a big thanks really to our audience you know we're doing this for you to try to inform you all of important topics related to um, trees and forests and natural resources and wildlife here in Kentucky and the region and um, it, we're glad to have you all as part of this group so thank you all so much for being with us each week
All right. And again, so uh, we'll see you next week at 11 o'clock. Make sure you join us on Wednesdays every week. And you can join us again on Facebook Live or go to fromthewoodstoday.com. And there is a watch live button that you can click there. All right. All right, folks. Thanks again. And we'll look forward to seeing you all next week at 11 at From the Woods Today.